Those who have survived the unthinkable and unspeakable violence behind the closed doors of their own homes are speaking out now more than ever. This podcast is dedicated to sharing their stories and the journeys of people who've transformed their lives from surviving into thriving. Join me and my guests as we dive into what healing from trauma really looks like. Hear heartwarming and awe-inspiring stories of overcoming the odds. Welcome to the Flow Rising Podcast. This show contains adult topics and often triggering stories. Audience discretion is advised. Before we get started, please make sure you subscribe to the channel, then like and share your favorite videos. Thanks for the support. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Flow Rising. This episode is going to be slightly different than the normal, but I'm very excited to have someone who is an expert in the field of healing and psychiatry and psychology and has written some books about the topics and is going to bring some great information to the audience today. So I'm excited to welcome Dr. Fred to the show. Dr. Fred, thank you so much for joining me today and bringing your expertise to yeah, the show. Yeah, my pleasure. I look forward to a great conversation, Megan. Thank you for having me on. It's really an honor. Super excited. So we always start every kind of show with who are you? What do you do? Who, who do you serve? All that fun kind of stuff, because this show does take that uh, perspective of kind of the entrepreneurial piece. I know you're also an author. So share with the audience a little bit about yourself and what you do. Right. So I'm um, my name is Dr. Fred, and um, I am a conventionally trained psychiatrist who does anything but psychiatry conventionally. I uh, I was started, uh, you know, my mental health journey uh, officially in like 1980, but you could say it started before that as well when I was born, because I was born to a family that was in a fair amount of disarray and chaos. I had two older brothers, 10 and 14 years older than me, and they were, um, you know, infighting with my parents. And I was really just born to bring joy and connection to that family. And uh, over the years, you know, people really counted on me to be able to connect with me. And that's who I was in elementary school. That's who I was in junior high and high school. Friends would come to me and tell me all their troubles and they'd tell me all their concerns. And I was like the local sort of kind of therapist. And um, I tried to go to college so that I could learn how to communicate even better because school in high school was certainly wasn't teaching me how to communicate effectively. So I went to the University of Michigan and uh, hoped that I would learn how to uh, communicate. It didn't happen. I dropped out and then I came back and tried again and I dropped out a second time. And I, after dropping out the second time, my mom got me a application to work at a state mental health facility for um, adolescent boys. And I began being a child care worker. Uh, and it was there that I really learned about mental health and the idea that communication and conversation and um, human connection were at the heart of all healing. <clears throat> and so that's what I did um, for several years and then decided I would go into psychiatry <clears throat> because I didn't like the way that psychiatry was unfolding. I wanted to bring communication, connection, and creativity um, and conversation to that field. And um, uh, so I, that's why I chose to go to medical school. I finished off my degree. Uh, locally, and then uh, applied to medical school and was fortunate to go to Northwestern University in Chicago, Illinois, and got my um, medical degree and then did a residency and, and then a fellowship in child and adolescent psychiatry and basically learned so much about um, people. But most of the learning that I did about people, again, was outside of the classroom. Um, I, during the years that I was in training is when Prozac was introduced to the world. And when Prozac was introduced to the world, it changed everything. It changed um, all the um, paradigms of what psychology and psychiatry had been up until that point. A new sense of biological psychiatry or chemical imbalance as the cause for any discomfort it arose. And even though I didn't want to become a diagnostician or a pharmacologist, I was already typecast when I came out to do both of those things. Now, I went into the field so that I wouldn't have to diagnose and wouldn't have to medicate, but I came out of the training having to do that. So there was a fair amount of duplicity each time I wrote a prescription or each time I diagnosed somebody. And I had the opportunity to actually meet about 40,000 people that would call me their doctor. So I had 40,000 patients. And I also wrote for over 100,000 prescriptions during my career. Eventually, I learned that that wasn't really what I wanted to do at all. And in 2006, I began to take out um, 
take some of my uh, clients off of medicine, actually remove the medicine that was causing more problems than it was helping. And they got way better. And many times their relationships at home got better and their diagnosis entirely disappeared when they came off their medicine. Um, I began to work with uh, different groups. I began to work with people who were having uh, troubles with their interrelations um, due to sometimes because of the injection of medications or of drugs and alcohol into the system that can really cause people to act differently than their core self. So some people think that they have a mental illness at the core, but in many cases, their mental illness is actually propagated by the drugs and the medicines that they take in order to relinquish those, or in order to deal with those symptomology. Um, and I really noticed that and began to really uh, focus on that. And over the next 10 years, worked all around the United States in multiple different arenas, multiple different modalities as a locum tenens, seeing um, how psychiatry and and uh, relationships unfolded throughout the whole country, and then began to do some international work. And I was in Asia for a bit, I was in Israel for a bit, and London and um, Paris, and uh, really got to see how psychiatry is delivered all over the world, and really got to see how relationships were measured all over the world as well. Like how people got along with each other is somewhat culturally defined. Like what is, you know, what is acceptable in one culture is not acceptable in another. And really got to see that with because of that, there wasn't, isn't a universal way of understanding how people get along. So um, if we fast forward a little bit, I wrote a couple books, um, Find Your True Voice, I wrote, and I wrote another book called The Creative Eight. And these books are meant to help people actually get to their core inner self. And then um, define it and refine it and then deliver it effectively into the world that is waiting to hear them and waiting to actually know their real self. Um, and then I also created a couple courses and I've done now some keynote speaking, really helping people learn how to communicate effectively with others, how to be self-expressed, how to listen, how to get in touch with that core inner rediscovered self and then deliver it effectively. Because that's what we really want more than anything in this world is to be heard for who we are and to really be connected to and gotten and resonated um, harmonically with another person. Yeah, no. And a lot of what you're saying is interesting. Uh, th this is a lot of, a lot of resonance that I hear with my t atypical guests, you know, us survivors of domestic violence is that we, it's that interpersonal, that core connection, that piece to ourselves that somewhere along our path got broken because that disruptive way that we were taught or, you know, engaged in relationships. But what I find fascinating, actually, I want to touch on it a little bit is the, uh, the medication piece, because so many people who come out of traumatic situations are misdiagnosed and handed medications that do absolutely nothing for them except exacerbate the problems. Um, and I would love for you just to talk a little bit about that. You don't have to go in depth because I know it's not what you do, but it is, it is what I do. Yeah, I mean, it is what you do now, but like you, you don't diagnose people and don't hand out meds anymore is what I meant. Right. Um, but just helping people understand, because like I was diagnosed with CPTSD just this year. And of course, the litany of we can get you this drug and that drug and this drug and that drug. And, and the, the only thing I said was, well, what natural remedies do I have? And therapists, psychiatrists, psychologists looked at me and went, there are none. Well, I just went to a naturopathic doctor yesterday who gave me a laundry list of things we can try that have nothing to do with any chemical. She's like, we can talk about diet. We can talk about sleep. We can talk about all of these things. So what, from your pr professional perspective, why do we, I'm curious as to why we try and hand out these pills. Is it because it's easy? Is it because it's money? You know, and how does that really affect because I'm sure you saw people who were like, hey, I've been in a traumatic situation. Fix me. And that pill seems like a quick fix. Yeah. Uh, yeah. People are really addicted to the whole idea that if they ingest something, they can get better. And, uh, you know, the doctors are really addicted to the idea that they have an answer and that it comes in the form of medicine. So um, the idea is this idea of a quick fix, is, which isn't what it is, like you said. 
Uh, even if it was a quick fix or even if it did nothing, I could actually vote for it. But it doesn't do nothing. It's not a quick fix. It actually perpetuates, exacerbates, advances, or sometimes even creates the symptoms it's marketed to treat. Now, if we start looking at that for what it is, we start seeing that the pills are um, negative bedfellows for this whole issue. And we start really seeing that in order to deal with whatever is going on, what's more than likely needed and called for is interrelation, proper interrelation with another person, hearing them for who they really are, accepting and having some compassion and forgiveness for another person. Now, not everybody is capable of that. And some people are, um, you know, have flown out of control and uh, are doing things that are really damaging to their relationships. And it's hard to have compassion, forgiveness, and acceptance for those people. In this case, we would call them maybe per um, uh, perpetrators, you know. The idea is, is that this group of people, you know, is making decisions that are damaging other folks. And it's hard to have a sense of, of um, forgiveness and compassion for that group. So, uh, but really, ultimately, what I would like to say is them and the re victims or and the recipient, what anyone wants, what all 7.8 billion of us on the planet want is to be heard and seen for who we are, for who we are realistically. Each and every person from the perpetrator to the victim to the observers, and to the family members and caregivers, what we really want is to be understood and gotten for who we really are. Yeah, no, that's, that's huge. That's actually been a personal, that's been big in my healing is actually getting in a healthy relationship for the first time in my life. And as confronting and challenging as like, almost, almost like feels like re-traumatizing because it's that neural rewiring of no, 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 safe, healthy, seen, heard, understood is just like mind blowing to me. I mean, having conversations with my husband now and he's like, no, you've never been seen. You've never been heard. This is why this feels strange. So share with us, obviously you've done <laughs> lots of human experimental research with all, you know, the, the 40,000 plus people that you worked with these books that you've written and talking about this interpersonal relationship. What are some of the things that you're, you know, the people you work with now or that you help them kind of step through and you don't have to give step by steps, but, you know, to, to help them uncover if this is, this is why it's important. And then even how, how you can go about changing these in your life, especially for people who have been those victims or victim mindset for so long. Right. And so, um, most people are really, de um, deficient in their capacity to self-express. Over time, we have learned how to become someone that we're not in order to protect the person that we are. And this is a non, this is a, this is a non-working model. It's kind of absurd and preposterous and ludicrous as a strategy. And it simply doesn't, you know, doesn't effectively work at all. So it leaves us, um, you know, we do that so that we won't be uh, disregarded or dismissed or, um, you know, that we won't create problems. But ultimately, even when you act like somebody you're not, you still get disregarded, dismissed, and create problems. So it doesn't even work to do what it's set out to do. Um, what I really help people do is, you know, walk into, um, like, you, you know, the question I think is, like, um, Help me again, rephrase the question so I make sure that I answer it. Sorry about that. That's fine. No, it's fine. I was just wondering, like, how can people get it, it just that that starting place? Oh, yeah. How can I take those first steps into most people this? realize that they're not expressing themselves effectively. And so what you end up doing is really giving a safety feature to the idea of taking small incremental changes towards your real self. Saying something you've never said to somebody, saying something that's kind that you've never said before, or saying something that actually moves the needle forward. And that one of the best ways to do this, one of the key ingredients to being self-expressed, if not the most important key ingredient to being self-expressed, is in the world of listening. Actually listening to another person. What is it that's being called for that will move the needle forward? or listening to the situation. What are the circumstances in the situation calling for that moves the needle forward effectively? And it is precisely in that area that I help people, like getting in touch with their true voice 
means moving the things that are out of the way, that are hurdles and obstacles that we have put in the way over time. And the crack in the cement has just gotten larger over time, and we've just never gone back to repair it. So we start removing those things, identifying and removing, giving people access to actually speaking what is their core self, who is their honest, genuine, authentic self, and then um, speaking that effectively, maybe initially with the people in their small circle, in their inner circle, and then stepping that out deeper and deeper into the real world and redefining yourself, sort of like you've had to do now that you're in a healthy relationship, like uh, redefining yourself as somebody that you didn't even know yourself to be. No. And yeah, and that's, that's huge. It, it's like I said, that's, that's my personal experience. And it's so, again, I, I adore this about my podcast because I get, I'm like you, I'm kind of a connoisseur of conversation. I just really love learning how other people are doing it because you know like your book that that finding that voice piece because that that for me and I only could talk from my perspective has been mind blowing how fast that took me from you know I'm four years out of my personal situation but for the first two years of that situation it was COVID so I didn't really have anybody to talk to except myself. But then the moment that I met my now husband and started sharing just even the genuine truth and then being like you know i don't know what's what's this uh, i'm kind of a nerd and i love sharing information and in my past everyone was like stop doing that i don't like that but he's like tell me more and having that that person to be like tell me more <laughs> right and just being able to speak i think that's huge for you know what i hear you saying is it's just that's it's huge to be able to just be like no this is who i am and have that accepted without exactly. judgment. It's very huge. And it's where all healing emanates from is being gotten and being connected to another person. Yeah. Very huge. So you mentioned a little bit before, and, and I think it's important that, you know, for, cause this show really speaks to the audience is really people who are somewhere in that healing journey. Maybe I haven't left my abusive situation. Maybe I'm just like, I've left, but I don't know what next steps to take. Talking, speaking, but there's also a piece that I kind of hear, and, and maybe you can talk about this, is a little bit about that forgiveness and compassionate piece for, you know, and I've experienced this, but for people who actually were our perpetrator or who were our abusers, how do you find that plays into this interpersonal piece for people? Well, that's very difficult at times. You know, if someone's been hurting you, it's hard to give them credit. If someone's been... um you know, abusing you or gaslighting you, manipulating you, painfully um, traumatizing you one way or another, emotionally, physically, sexually, etc. Um, it is hard to forgive that person. Uh, you feel like forgiving that person is actually in some ways um, um, like supporting what they did, you know, like in some ways it's, it's, uh, sanctioning what they did, you know, and in fact, it isn't that at all. The, when you forgive, you take away the rent space in your head that's being utilized when, when you stay in, um, when you stay in resentment. So being resentful, being, um, you know, uh, like vindictive and, uh, you know, creating, uh, guilt and blame is an inside job. And the idea is that you can theoretically forgive that person without, um, you know, without, uh, there's a word that I'm missing. It's a common <laughs> word, you know, without giving them, uh, without supporting what they've done, right? Without um, saying that you agree with that what they did was okay. So um, that's something that you can do. And it's not simple, but it, when you forgive someone and then forgive yourself as well, for being in that relationship that was uh, that was traumatic or uh, terrifying or uh, abusive, um, there's a lot of rent space that gets opened up, and you become open to the possibility of having real relationship. Yeah, no, I think that that's that that was what I was kind of you know getting at that it's it's yeah forgiveness doesn't mean that it's permission that what they did was acceptable. It's just that letting it go for yourself. Um, right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that that I've I've heard other people say that, and it's 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 interesting because because um, we do we feel like oh I can't forgive them like whoa oh, no, that's <laughs> that's right. that is way too hard for me but that actually is holding on to those old um those old things so 
I, you know, for me personally, like finding that voice and like starting to talk was difficult. What do you, are there ways that people can, if, like, if, for example, uh, like actually having a voice, like physically speaking for me was actually hard because part of my abuse was that I went silent at the end. What are some ways that people could help get that unstuck for themselves? Maybe it's, you know, working with someone like you, or maybe it's, but it's like, how can they find ways to get that story or get that ball rolling if they really actually have lost words, don't have words? Because that's a common thing that I hear people say as well, that they've lost the ability to talk. Well, it's interesting. So words are not the only way to self-express. And so we start looking at creative ways to self-express through art and music and dancing and singing and drama, cooking, writing, gardening, things like that. And that one of my books, The Creative Eight, was actually focused exactly on that. And if you start doing those things, you tap into a new activation of capacity to communicate effectively using alternative forms of self-expression. So that becomes one entire real uh, possibility of a way to relearn how to communicate using alternative means beyond that, which is just uh, speaking and hearing. Um, so that's one way. Another way that I found it can be really effective is actually called mirror work, which is you look at yourself in the mirror. You get yourself at a space and you communicate directly with that person in the mirror until they can smile at you, until they can mm -hmm. actually listen to you. And um, that's really interesting uh, to do that. And you could do that effectively without ever embarrassing yourself with anybody else. And you can actually speak to the mirror. It may seem very weird initially, but when you do it and you start seeing that that person over there is just another person watching you, it's an effective way to take initial steps towards self-communication. Yeah, I love that one. I I had a, a, a healer early on in my personal healing journey say, oh, you need to tell yourself I love you every day. And I was like, man, I can't do that. And so, and I told her that I'm like, that no that's and she goes okay so i'm going to challenge you and her challenge was look at yourself in the mirror i'm like i can't that's too much too so her challenge then she goes let's take it one baby step she goes can you look at a spot on yourself like yeah i have a dimple here she's like stare at your dimple talk to the dimple yeah <laughs> and then slowly talk to your mouth and then slowly talk to your nose and then all of a sudden you're looking at your eyes and then you're talking exactly because, and, or the other thing that i've Ha uh, other guests have shared is the um the sticky note on the mirror You're right if you can't say it write it down and stick the sticky note and read it and even if you can't get it out loud like it, you, you know you put your makeup on or brush your teeth and there's words yeah we, we naturally want to just read the words right and whatever that is and that you know that that's that positive you know that positive self-reinforcement which actually right. feels super confronting at first right um for people to actually go Oh, that, like you said, but eventually you do see that you are a human in the mirror, in the mirror, and you're just a person that you get to talk to as well, right. um, which is, is huge. Let's circle back to that creative piece. Cause I, you know, that was one of the things in our, uh, pre-interview conversation that intrigued me the most was your work now. And your I think it's your, is it your most recent book that talks about the creativity? Uh, the, it was actually the first book I wrote, Creativity, the, the Creative Eight, Healing Through Creativity and Self-Expression. And um, um, that's just a book of t talks about alternative ways of self-expression, using art or music or dancing, or singing and drama, uh, cooking, writing and gardening. And um, those are the top eight. And they're just, I notice that when I'm doing those things, I find a new a new way to communicate that, that I activate and it's over and above that, which is uh, the words, you know? And yeah. when, when I activate those, I, I become more um, enmeshed in my best way of communicating and who I really am and sometimes can tap areas of life that I didn't even know I had and then really become more and more comfortable with communicating with others. Yeah, no, and I, I will totally resonate that. It's it's funny how how many of my guests, that's something that comes up. Oh, I went back to music because before my abuse, I was into music, you know, and I had that where I was like, oh, I was into music, I used to sing, but I had inner ear damage from my abuse. So I couldn't sing anymore. But finding, you know, turning on music and, and moving, but gardening for me, when you said gardening was on the top eight, I was like, and actually it was you 
my newfound love of gardening over the past two years is that creative. Oh, like I didn't even dawn on me that gardening is, you know, and I've read things where it's like, there's actual microbes in the dirt that are antidepressants, like you getting in the dirt and getting in the sunshine and all of those things. Um, but yeah. even as I'm talking about it, it's funny. I feel my, like my endorphins rising, just talking about it yeah, and being like, exactly. Oh, it's something I'm passionate about. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and I'm kind of curious, you know, for people that you work with or, you know, who are, who are struggling, how do we find, I mean, for me, it was like, it just happenstance turned into cooking and gardening, but how can people like look and go, what's, you know, that maybe they're like me, I'm not an artist. There's no way I don't draw. I don't do that kind of stuff, but how can they find a creative space or what's ways to actually go, Oh, this is a creative thing that maybe I didn't know was creative. Well, you just get started. I mean, you know what, you, you don't need to have a guitar to be, to play music. You can, um, you can just take a pencil and tap it on the table and mm -hmm. you don't need to have an easel and a bunch of um, oil paints to uh, make art. You can just take a pencil and, or, you know, a pen and draw or trace. And same thing with writing. You don't need to have, um, you know, a bunch of published books to be a writer. You can just take out a journal and write. You just give yourself a little room to realize that you're capable of doing all these things. Everyone is capable of doing a little bit of art, a little bit of music, a little bit of dancing or singing or drama, or cooking and writing and gardening. You can do that. And when you do that, again, you'll see very naturally. You won't see it if you don't do it. But if you do do it, you'll see experientially that new forms of communication and self-expression do arise. Which kind of leads into your your most recent book, which is about talking about that that voice piece. So share with us a bit about the most current book and some of, of the stuff that you talk about in that book um, about the, I believe it's like your inner voice, or I'm sorry, you have to tell it's me It's called the title Find again. Your True Voice. Find Your True Voice. And uh, yes. basically we use, um, it, it, of all things, we use podcasting as a template in that book. So the idea okay. is to actually take those incremental steps. Notice where you are not being you. Notice, you know, and be really kind and compassionate and affectionate with yourself and really uh, get that there's capacity to speak your true voice and to speak it openly and that people are very eager to hear who you really are. Like you start getting the feedback loop that people are very interested in your authentic self. And we all can tell when people are being inauthentic. We tend to be fairly forgiving of people who are inauthentic. And we don't, we're not really, um, we're not really focused on our own need to be authentic and genuine and honest. And we think that that's frightening to do that because we're afraid that we're going to be dismissed or cause problems. And instead, when we're genuine, open and honest and authentic with ourselves, we cause less problems. It becomes much easier to be ourselves when we're being ourselves. If we keep thinking about what it would be like, you know, who we have to be in order to protect ourselves, it takes up a lot of energy, a lot of mind work, and um, doesn't really work anyways, as we've already said. Yeah, no, I, I will absolutely resonate that, that the more that with the podcasting, it's, it's so funny how that was a piece of it, because I was like, okay, I don't know why I feel like doing a podcast. And my first one was the, before this one was just about entrepreneurship and business because that's what I knew. And I was like, oh, it's, and, and the topic started boring me. But I got the experience of, of all the things in the world, watching myself on camera was yeah, the biggest exactly. one for me was seeing that because I'm extremely expressive. And I always thought that, again, that authentic piece. I always thought people didn't like the, the way that I'm expressive and the way I exactly. move. And, and so I would like, when I first started, I'd sit on my hands and I couldn't talk. Exactly. <laughs> so that leaning into that authentic piece, I love that you're saying that it's like, nope, just uh, the other thing you talk, I've heard you say it a couple of times is like moving the needle or just taking those baby steps or um, how do you, I mean, and maybe it's something in your book or just something you've done personally, but you know, we have this big giant goal and then we're like, oh, that's too big. What's something that either you do personally or you help clients with just go, no, that's actually a step towards the goal. What, you know, how do we identify something that actually is moving the needle rather than just staying stagnant? Then rather than what is it? Did you say? Rather than just staying stagnant. Cause sometimes it doesn't feel like it doesn't feel like I'm taking big action. 
But I, I noticed that like, oh, I took that one little tiny action and oh, all of a sudden I am taking big action. Exactly. So yeah, how do we, we identify those little ones? The little ones are just, you know, saying something you've never said before, doing something you've never done before, um, or even thinking things you've never thought before, and then mm. actually taking action along those lines. So taking people in your inner circle and telling them that you love them or telling them a story about yourself or telling them something that up until now you have thought is, isn't, um, you know, isn't appropriate or doesn't fit the relationship you have with them. So just cracking through new ice, like actually uh, taking on new boundaries and moving them forward a little bit can be really helpful in giving us the experience of self-expressing in ways, you know, in new ways. And it tends, like you said, to activate. Um, it, it It is addicting in its own right. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's something that you know, once you start getting the pleasure of what it is to be authentic and you create authenticity for other people, when you're authentic, then other people can be authentic with you. And that when that starts happening, it becomes something that you'd much rather do rather than, you know, guard yourself by being someone you're not. Oh, yeah. I, I, <laughs> how many of us have been in that inane conversation where we're like, that small talk. I hate small talk. I've always hated small talk since I was a little kid, but that's like the social lubricant, right? We're supposed to talk about the weather and the sports. And I'm like, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. And finally, like I started actually saying that I get in conversations with people and they're like doing that thing. And, and I look at them and I'm like, not to be rude, but I really don't care. How are you? What are you up to? Like, tell me something about yourself. And they look at me and they're like, I have permission to do that. I'm like, yeah, totally. Let's, let's talk about you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, because I personally hate, and I find most people are like, oh my God, I hate small talk. Thank you for giving me permission to not have small right. talk. Exactly. And so it is, it's amazing whatever, you know, this is just personal things that I've kind of seen that I'm like, oh, um, how have you seen these types of things as you work with people? Um, you know, like you talked about getting people off medication and doing more of these active steps. Um, how have you seen, you know, and maybe some, you don't have to sh share as, you know, whatever, whatever you can share, but what are some stories or things that you've seen people go from like, I'm completely incapable of functioning in society to, oh, wow, look at me do these things. Yeah. Um, so I taught a course this. called the True Voice Podcasting. And most of the people there, many of the people didn't even know how to move a mouse necessarily, or let alone what a podcast, they had not heard of a podcast before, had never seen one. And these people all became podcasters during the course. Wow. And, you know, the idea, again, was not only did they learn how to self-express, but they learned how to do it in public. They learned how to do it with others. And they learned how to be um, less afraid. In other words, you can be afraid and speak yourself uh, authentically or be afraid and not speak yourself authentically. But the fear is going to be there no matter what. And so we don't get to move that fear out of the way we get to incorporate it into how we manage life. And we start really getting in touch with our truest self. We start really getting in touch with our genuine self. And that's what we start expressing with others. And from there is when we really get to make the gains of what it means to connect with another person. Yeah, I love that. We do it. <laughs> there is never going to be a time when you are not afraid. You just do it anyway. <laughs> exactly. That's right. Yeah, you do it anyway. We keep, yeah. we keep going forward. Um, what are some benefits that you see of people doing things? Because it sounded like that was a group kind of thing. Um, is there benefits, individual versus group, or does it just kind of depend on how you are as a person? I think if you're with like-minded, gentle, kind um, uh, individuals in a group who know what you're there for and there for similar things, then a group can be very effective because you get different um, input, you get different feedback, you get different... Um, viewpoints. And that can go a long ways to teaching you different ways that you might want to choose to be in various situations. I think individual can be extremely helpful because it can stay private. You can feel confidential. You can feel like you can share openly and honestly and not be afraid that it's going to leak. And uh, so, you know, individual work to find your true voice is really more about work of uncovering and then um, you know, unveiling and then removing the things that are in the way of who you really are, who you've really been your whole life, 
and moving those things out of the way so that you get access to that true self of yours without um, the complexity of being with a bunch of people. Yeah, because I, I know that that was for me that, uh, like I said, I, I got divorced and left my situation during COVID. So it was so easy just to become insular, just, hey, the world shut off. I, you know, I said, oh, I'm an introvert. It doesn't really matter. And uh, and, and I'm actually, <laughs> I, I'm giggling, but I'm actually finding it a challenge to break that, to be right. like, no, no, you actually, you, you're going to have to go out. I mean, I do this. This was my first step into it was getting one-on-one -on -one with people, but no, you're going to actually have to, if you want to have human connection, you actually you got to go be with people. Yeah. Um, so I guess one of the other things that, that I get kind of curious about is, um, how do, how do people, you know, I mean, is it just like a darts and a dartboard? We just try stuff. Is that what you kind of suggest to people? Or is there like something you say, Hey, look at yourself and figure out these certain things that you might like, and then go try and be in groups and things or what, what's, is it just try it? Right. I uh, know. I think uh, there are some things that you can know that you're likely to do be pretty effective in. If you're, for instance, maybe you're looking at mindfulness and you want to take a yoga class or a Tai Chi class or a Qigong class or something like that. And, um, you know, this might be a good area for you to connect with other people who are like minded, who are interested in that. Or you might want to, you know, get a personal trainer or at least join a gym and uh, getting some movement there. And, you know, you can interact or be interacted with in those settings in a very low pressure situation. Um, and, you know, the pressure that we present to ourselves is uh, variable. Like we, you know, that we're the ones who actually design how much pressure is happening to us. There's not a real thing called pressure. You know, it's not, it's not something on the outside that happens to us. It's what we accept and then apply to ourselves. So, you know, what is more intimidating or less intimidating is really a function of what you see um, is in front of you. And if you want to try something new in your self-expression, you could take an art class, you could take a music class, you could take a, you know, a piano lesson, or you could take a, a dancing um, class. And these are all ways where you can meet new people who are also interested in self-expression for sure. Yeah, no, I love, I love that suggestion. Cause I think that like I said, that was for me, it's like, oh, oh it, and I'm going to ask you about the dangers of social media. Yeah. The reason I say that it's, it's dangerous and you may disagree it or whatever is. is that we feel like we're connecting, but are we actually connecting on social media? Can it be used to actually connect or is it better for us to actually go do that in-person thing and actually get out and, and face to face. I think face to face is a more, certainly a more genuine, authentic connection. And, you know, the connections that we have on social media have, um, you know, have their own very inherent and often ambiguous, uh, um, limitations associated with it, who we befriend, why we befriend them, what we say, what they say to us, why we like comments, why we share all of those things, you know, which pictures do we show and what do they really mean when they said that and what are their politics and are they, is that really a troll or is that, you know, all the things that we have to be uh, considerate of are not really human life experiences the way they were designed to be, at least up until now. Now, you can make a case that this is how it's going and this is how it's designed to be because this is how it's happening. So because it's happening the way it is, it must be how it was designed to be. And that might be true to some degree, but this is a lot more complicated and um, a lot less um, organic um, in dealing with social media. Now, when we actually get the opportunity to go meet somebody and whether it's to have coffee or take a walk or meet in their living room or your living room, um, you can see that the challenges are a little bit different, um, but you can uh, actually be with someone and get the whole multidimensionality of being with someone rather than sharing at a pixelated screen and calling that your friend. Yeah. And I think yeah, that's, I asked for pure self edification because honestly, that's where I've been stuck is I find myself in this loop of going, oh, I'm seeking connection. And then I go to social media and that's not actually connecting to people. Um, you know, I'm, you, I've learned to 
I'm taking it as a catalyst. So I'm like part of local groups, right? They're local to my, so I said, okay, I'm going to take it one step further and just put it out on this local group. Hey, I'd like to start an in-person lunch club for women. That was something I did recently. And I was surprised I got responses. Like I actually was genuinely thinking, oh, no one's going to actually. And so now I'm like, okay, take the next step and actually do the thing. So I, that was why I was kind of asking, we can use it as a tool, but I agree. I think that getting together in person is actually where that, it's... that change catalyst happens of, oh, this is my authentic self. This is, oh, you know, these are people that I like. These are people that I, nope, that's, that's showing up the way it used to, but we can't get that sense of it when that screen or, and even I would say doing what you and I are doing here is one step better, but it's still not quite the same as actually getting together with a human for sure. person. For sure. If we yeah. were in the same studio or we were at a coffee house, it would be much more intimate and much more, um, much more solid resonating, uh, relationship for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I just think that that's important for the audience to note that as they're traveling through finding this authentic voice, learning to express themselves, because that is the biggest part of healing exactly. um, is that's really what we're trying to do is it get is. out of ourselves and, and find that, that exactly. at some point you can't, you can't let the screen or the electronics stay between you and the human. Um, because that's where that actually happens is that in-person piece. Um, so as we're coming to the end of time, is there anything that you'd like to share with the audience about, you know, something maybe we haven't talked about or something in the books that I didn't ask about? Um, that's come into mind that you'd like to share, re re you know, as we're coming towards the end of our time together? Well, I think that the biggest thing is there might be nothing wrong with you. There might be nothing wrong with your, who, you, the listener. There might be nothing. You might think there's something wrong because you're miserable a lot of the day or you're anxious or nervous or you're having trouble completing tasks or you don't want to go social or you don't know how to start a relationship or you don't know how to keep a relationship. All of that are functions of the human condition. And there might not be anything actually wrong with you, even though you feel terrible. So feeling terrible is part of the human condition. And when you can get that you might not have a mental illness, you might not be deficient or defective at all. You might not be afflicted. You might not be an outcast. You might not really have those kind of issues. Then um, there's a new level of opening and freedom that comes up when you realize that this isn't something wrong with me. I'm just being human in a human, you know, in a human circumstance. Um, you know, Christian Murthy, I like to quote him. He said, uh, it's no sign of mental health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. It's a very good point. That is a very good point as we come to the end of our time that, yep, there may just be nothing wrong with you. You're human. Exactly. <laughs> Yes, I love that. That's fantastic. So I always ask my guests at the very end, if someone is watching or listening to the show and would love to get connected with you, what's a really good way for people to get connected with you? The best way to get connected with me is to go to my main site, which is Dr. Fred 360, drfred360.com. And there you can, um, you can reach out to me. There's a contact button there and all, there's all sorts of freebies. You can download my book. You can actually buy my you can get uh, me to send you a hard copy of the book for just shipping and handling. You can see some of my podcasts. You can see my courses. And there's a lot of things going on. And um, if you really want to just email me directly, that's Dr. Fred at welcome to humanity dot net. Dr. Fred at welcome to humanity dot net is another way. And we could set up a one to one. And for your listeners, I'll, of course, like many other podcast guests, um, but for real, I, I do offer um a uh, a discovery call to see if there's a good fit between me and anyone who might want to work with me. Perfect. All of those links, as always, are in the show notes below. So for anyone watching or listening, just tap a link, get connected, email, um, or on the website. So Dr. Fred, thank you so much for spending some of your time and joining me today to share with my audience um, a little bit about what it is that you do and some different ways that we can find healing through finding our thank you voices yeah, yeah really beautiful really appreciate it thanks so much megan it's great to talk absolutely. to you absolutely so to okay. the audience who joined us today thank you for joining us and as always i'm wishing you peace love and flow and may your flow be ever rising until next time friends mm -hmm.